Okay, uh, question and answer session for uh, environmental data. We started off with, with two talks, one which was an overview and the other which, which um, gave a view of, of climate data resources for, for niche modeling. Uh, I'm gonna show you, as I usually do, uh, where we are in the course, which is to say, <laughs> here's the course plan, and we are down here. There we are. There are our two um, talks that we were, we were talking about this week um, with Sarah giving the environmental data overview and Dirk giving the climate data overview. Um, and then as of uh, Monday, we will um, we'll start into, uh-oh, look who's up, Mona. Uh, is going to talk about <laughs> sensing data and Gabriela Zukim on soils databases. So those are our two for this coming Monday. Okay, so let's let's go down through the questions. Um, we are at one thousand three hundred and four questions that have been asked. Um, we obviously don't get to answer all of them. Uh, or even many of them, but what we try to do is to answer the ones that uh, either are repeated questions or that um, or that are particularly relevant or particularly meaningful. Um, ladies, any any question you'd like to start with? Mm. I don't know. I have. Uh, I was reading the the questions, and for me, something that uh, people normally ask, and also in, in other uh, courses, is about um, the resolution of the variables. I think people are used to working and go to the field work and collect the data and everything, and then they, when they learn about these techniques, they don't like the fact that the variables are at. 50 kilometer resolution or 10 kilometer resolution. So they were like stressed, like, and what's happening with my species because my species can be under a rock or like, uh, so I, I think we can talk about this and, and like why we can use this broad scale climatic models for macroecology or biogeography and yeah. I think that's a great topic to take on. Do you want to start or? Or, or start your, or Monica can start and, and or no, give give your, or Mona, sorry, Mona. Oh, both, both are, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mona or Monica. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with this. Uh, a lot of times um, there's this realization that, oh, the, the amazing field that I collected and I spent three years, uh, I can't, I don't have good, environmental, high resolution environmental data for the great uh, um, occurrence data that, that someone has. But I would say that, um, so the talk on Monday, the, one of the talk, the environmental, sorry, the remote sensing data mm -hmm. gets into more, gets into the more uh, higher resolution data uh, available. So we can talk, I, I'll talk about that. Um, cool, this is nice, yeah. Yeah, uh, but yeah, we have to work with what what exists um, yeah. because it's impossible to create your own uh, data unless you work at your uh, unless the extent of the of the study area is small and you can create your own environmental variables. Any macroecology, uh, biogeography, larger scale conservation question uh, yeah. relies on I what's in the network. Most of the times I try to, to answer this, like it depends on your question also. Yes. Like for, for yes. some of the, um, the things, if you are working with all the mammals at a global scale and you mm -hmm. wonder about, uh, I don't know, how this, uh, the richness patterns are going to change in the future or the hotspots of diversity are going to change. And for these broad patterns, 
I think you can use this kind of variables like, okay, so they are going to go northern or southern or they are going to shrink or something like that. But of course, if you are very interested in one particular plant that is, uh, I don't know, from one valley uh, in a mountain, and, and then for sure, like you cannot uh, go for uh, this kind of models. Uh, well, maybe, so remote, yeah, maybe remote sensing is, is, uh, is solving this issue and you can really have very detailed information yeah, with other things. Yeah, I see a question that is related to what we are talking. So line 1208, uh, it's, the question is for, for Dirk, but it says, I understood um, and uh, my doubt is I understood to downscaling data as improved the resolution of a database. The resampling can be considered a model to change to the resolution. So it's a bit uh, choppy, the question, but I think it talks about addressing this lack of high resolution data by downscaling, uh, let's say top down head on, on his screen uh, world team. What if we downscale the uh, one kilometer resolution, the finest, the 30 second arc seconds. Uh, what if we downscale that to my, you know, 100 meter resolution? And that's um, that's something we cannot do, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can do the, the downscaling will create a, a finer resolution pixel, but the information will not be good. And yeah, Down is showing us something very important. <laughs> well. Yeah. So, so let's let's take on this question of can you or can't you just downscale it further? Yeah. Why do we have this thirty second uh, resolution layer? It's one kilometer. Yeah. Look at the distribution of climate stations. Now there are places in the world that have a pretty good density, but even in the U.S., in the eastern U.S. or in India or in in Eastern Australia, those climate stations are not every kilometer. In fact, they're not every 10 kilometers or every 100 kilometers. They're just a lot of them, but there's still a huge amount of interpolation. And many of the studies we do are not in those densely uh, populated areas with, with lots of climate stations. Um, and there you have even sparser data. So one, one thing to remember, you know, when you go to Chelsea or, or World Clim or Mariclim or whichever, it's all obviously attractive to grab this, you know, this nice 30 <coughs> second uh, resolution coverage, but that's probably over representing the true resolution of the underlying primary data. And so what you're seeing when you, when you look at that 30 second resolution grid is more than anything, you're seeing a digital elevation model. More than true yeah, this is, variation in climate. I think it was a topo, no, that they used it, or it was one kilometer altitude model. So that's one point, you know, the, the true resolution depending on the region where you are, where it's reasonable to do a downscale, it might be up here, or it might even be coarser than, than 10 minutes, which is like 17 kilometers at the, at the equator. It might be very coarse if you do not want to analyze climate uh, layers that are just broad interpolations from a digital elevation model. That's point number one. Point number two is it's great. Let's say we can use the, the 30 second resolution um, climate coverages. What is the spatial resolution and spatial accuracy of your occurrence data? And essentially the occurrence data and the environmental data in in ecological niche modeling, they have to go hand in hand. If one of them is fine and the other is coarse, you're going to get into very serious problems of essentially misassigning environmental values 
because either the, the environmental data are too fine or too coarse, or the occurrence data are too precise or imprecise. Yeah, for me, it's been a long time since I am thinking about writing something about accuracy and precision in, in, <laughs> in these kind of things, because people are very, uh, they want things to be very precise and they are not accurate at all. So it's something like, okay, you, 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 you have like a balance of things and, and yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, if you go to the, the Manus referencing methods, is um, this is a very very useful set of um, work that's been done on geographic referencing okay I didn't know that um, I'll, I'll put this in the in the packet for, for the course for this week um, but essentially this is a set of calculators that allow you to calculate the the latitude and longitude coordinates that correspond to a point. Let's say it's you know five kilometers north of Lawrence, Kansas. Okay, mm -hmm. but then it also allows you to get at the accuracy with which um, those coordinates apply. So when I say five kilometers north of Lawrence, Kansas, well, first of all. What is Lawrence, Kansas? Is it the current centroid of the city? Or is it the centroid in 1970? Or is it the northern edge now or the northern edge in 1970? So I've got some uncertainty about where Lawrence is. And then five kilometers, is that five as opposed to six? Or is that five as opposed to 5.001? And then when we say north, is that north as opposed to east or west? Or is it north as opposed to northwest or northeast? Anyhow, it's a whole, a whole set of um, tools for getting at essentially what's a radius of uncertainty, which is the same as, or the, the opposite of accuracy. Yep. But notice that even if we have a, a very broad maximum error distance, in this case it's 1.7 kilometers, we have extremely precise coordinates. This is down to uh, you know a, a hundred thousandth or a millionth of a degree, which is mm -hmm. centimeters yeah. or millimeters. Yeah. So yeah, that difference between accuracy and precision is crucial. Uh, yeah. I'd love to see you develop that, Sarah. <laughs> and, and for me, maybe uh, with all these things right now, uh, people need to understand that we are working at, yeah, I, I said like the methods and the, um, and the layers and everything now is for working at a coarse scale, I would say. And the climate means the climate of an area, the, the climate in Berlin. I don't care where in Berlin, but more or less here is temperature. It's raining more or less in the summer, and in the winter it's more or less cold and done. So the species can be here. I don't know where in Berlin, but they can be here, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and even 50 kilometers, I don't care. Here, more or less, the climate is very, very similar so I don't care 50 kilometers any direction I know that in the mountains for instance things can get tricky but maybe you, you can say that in this kind of mountains the species can be and then where in these mountains maybe you need to make another another model like they say something like occupancy models and things like that not like where the individuals are within these 50 kilometers if they are more close to the rivers or more or less uh, I don't know like climatically they can be there and there is, uh, I don't know, altitude heterogeneity enough for them to survive. But then if they are in this slope or in the other slope, it depends on a lot of things, on the vegetation that is there and, and more things that, that maybe we cannot, we cannot model at a large scale with a lot of um, species with, yeah, 
This, this also depends on if you work with one species or 100, or if you work with uh, uh, South America, or you work with some valley that you really need to understand where are the individuals. So I guess, I guess with this kind of things of resolution and thing, the, the, my, my suggestion is, is uh, first think what you need and, and what, what you need to solve your question. What is your question and what you need to solve your question? And yeah. Yeah, I think that's the first and probably a difficult question for, uh, I noticed with students that I had this question of what scale is relevant to your question biologically. Yes. Yes. And by scale, I mean both resolution yes. and extent. Yes. And, and yes. that is hard yes. to answer, yes. uh, but it's important because, um, well, that's the first question. And then you have to realize, you have, you have to realize that you are limited in the uh, variables, availability of variables, uh, resolution, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we get very uh, antsy or very eager to, to really do a niche modeling project at the resolution of a national park. And then we get into the trouble of resampling world clean to 100 meters and doing crazy things. Uh, but yeah, it's better to just from the beginning ask yourself, okay, what is the resolution of my question? What is the extent of my question? Do I have the variables that I, and if not, you might need to abandon that question or you might need to, to, to approach that question from a different modeling perspective, not, not this. So. Yeah, but it's important to be free at this stage, like you are saying, like think, think freely about what you would like to have and, and, yeah. and, and identify it because uh, sometimes with these questions also, and there is something that always happens, you have very broad questions like, what is the best model for plotting species or for, for mapping species? Like, uh, like uh, what, what is like the recipe? There is no recipe. It depends on your question. It depends on like... Uh, related to that, sorry, no, I was going to say related to that, <laughs> if you want to go to question, uh, to line 1219, what is the maximum number of layers that should be used when modeling species distributions? <laughs> That's one, you know, yeah. one question where we don't have the answer. <laughs> it depends on your, on your system, yeah. on your models, on your, yeah. It also depends on how you handle them. You may start with yes. 100 and throw away 90 at the first pass. Mm -hmm. Just to go back one second, uh, the climate data and you know kind of data that you find on gbif paradigm in modeling niches yes it's limited to pretty coarse scales and broad extents but that doesn't mean you should just not bother with with listening to mona's video on remote sensing on monday mm -hmm. uh, many people have data that they have collected specifically for projects, uh, maybe with a, a, a GPS unit. And so long as there's either very good control of, um, of the georeferencing and, and you know, using precise tools like a GPS unit, or so long as there is good filtering of the data, which is to say, um, you might have 10,000 records for a species and you filter based on those uncertainty measures that I was just showing you. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll talk about this, this later on. But you could filter and say, well, I want only records that have a maximum error distance of 100 meters or less. In this case, the record is 1,700 meters, so we'd throw it away. Um, but anyhow, just to, to make the point that we can still do these studies, we just have to be careful and responsible about what occurrence data we use and what environmental data we use and make sure that they are consistent one with the other. Yeah, and also temporarily, like some student also was asking about uh, if you have some species that is just appearing in the summer, I don't remember what is the question, but it was something like that. Like I am 
want to map some insect that is only active in the summer, which variables I need. It's like, well, I guess summer variables or the variables that you think they, they are important for the species, but maybe also winter variables if the species is under, I don't know, the soil and it needs some temperature, if not he's going to die or something like that. So, so both things, surviving the winter and, and, and being active in summer, maybe they are important. Or even, I, I would like, love to, to see more um, your research about uh, phenology and, and activity and things like, um, I don't know, for, lay, for, for laying the eggs, the species needs uh, to have precipitation and something like, okay, so for breathing, we need this thing, not for surviving, but for, for, for something else. I don't know. I, I think that's a, I mean, it kind of goes back to the question at 1219. Um, how do we choose and how do we, I mean, you can imagine one, one approach would be to find every environmental variable possible hmm. and use your data to, to reduce that pool empirically down to the four or five layers that are most relevant. Or the other approach, which, which was quite in fashion 10, 15, 20 years ago, is to say, well, I study plants, and so I'm going to use growing degree days and this and this. And there, there were, I remember there was a thread of a, a set of three uh, variables that a lot of the, the people who work with plants wanted to use just those three variables. You can imagine kind of at that end of the spectrum saying, I know the natural history of my species extremely well, yeah. and I want just the minimum temperature in the, in the winter and the average temperature in May and this, nothing else. But I think this is cool. I, I have the, the opposite uh, experience. Like, I don't know anything about the species, so I'm going to take the 19 uh, working variables and I don't care. So it's like, okay. Uh, so, so I think it's okay if you have some knowledge about your species and you can say like, I think the temperature in May is important because they breathe in May and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, that, that's what I mean, where, where yeah. you, you could start at either end of that spectrum. Yes, yes, and, and normally you have a lot of uh, automatic uh, algorithm to select the variables and, and, and people are using this. I mean, one thing I've done at times, you know, I, I work with some disease systems where we basically just know nothing about, about mm. the environmental dimensions. And so one thing I've done at times is to create groups of variables. Like here's a bunch of precipitation variables, and here's a bunch of you know, summer temperature variables, and here's a bunch of winter temperature variables. And then I do models with different, different sets of those sets of variables. So what does a precipitation only model look like? And how does it perform relative to precipitation and summer temperature, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can, yep. you can work through and essentially test all the combinations of those types of information. And then, you know, through some sort of selection process, we'll talk about this at length later in the course, but through some sort of selection process, you can basically say, well, empirically, the, the precipitation variables had no contribution and it was all temperature or whatever, whatever your particular data and your particular system have to say. Well, related to that, Dan, uh, the question right above the one you highlighted in yellow, um, talks about, uh, asks about the quarter, uh, quarter variables. Um, and I, I, I went through the slides quickly uh, yesterday. Uh, I didn't listen to the explanation, the video, but yeah, they were there, uh, talked about or showed how, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't listen, uh, but showed how some variables, some of these quarter variables at the global um, extent create very strange patterns. And he had okay. one that I don't remember which one, but Africa had these nice waves. <laughs> yeah, the um, interpolation. See. Yes. <laughs> so maybe we should, do you want to talk about this question, uh, answer this question, uh, about the variables? Sure, sure. sure. Um, my general feeling is 
if you're in that kind of luxury class of, I know a lot about my species, then you should create variables that are as specific as possible to those characteristics. You know, so I don't know, my species is above ground only during the rainy season. Well, create some variables that speak only to the rainy season. Um, so I'm not opposed to the idea of quarter variables versus month variables versus annual variables. I think it depends on your species and on your question. Now, some of the quarter and month variables are really bad. Um, in fact, while we talk, I'll show you all. Um, but there are there are the so-called bioclimatic variables that cross between precipitation and temperature. Mm -hmm. So you know the average temperature of the of the driest month. Well, those variables have some really weird um, artifacts in them. You got you guys talk for a bit, and I oh. will put some of these up just to illustrate it. I was gonna follow up. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say that you, Tanya, said create your own variables, and I, I think that's that's even. I mean, people are used to downloading the nineteen bioclimate variables, but the, you you can download um, mean monthly variables, uh, mean maximum uh, mean uh, temperature, and then precipitation for each month, averaged over those fifty years. Uh, I don't remember nineteen fifty to two thousand. I guess. Uh, World clean, so you could actually create your own, you know, three month or one month uh, average. You don't have to use necessarily the bio. If you if you know that your species is breeding between March and and May, and you really want those three, the uh, maximum and minimum uh, temperature or mean temperature and precipitation for those two or three months, you can create those. You don't have to rely on bio clean number i don't know which one would that be yeah i think the, f the future is going to be more like that like uh, or we need to ask for a project to do this kind of variables and to because this is something like you can do it but this is a lot of time and this you need to maybe to, to process the things and not everybody knows how to do the thing so for that reason working was super famous because you just click and download and you just use it mm -hmm. so yeah, and, and now I feel that a lot of people are, are building layers and, and, and making like new things and mm -hmm. yeah, so making more biologically meaningful variables, not, not just yeah. the average of, um, yeah. With, I think with the simple things like I want two months of data, of world team data, um, yeah. as long as you, you know, you know how to use, how to work with rasters, it's not, it takes a bit more time. Now, if you're right, everything else, like all, not everything else, but other climatic, other sources of uh, climatic data are less, less easy to use. Uh, yes. You need to yes. spend a bit more time, but, but I yes. don't have, you know, coding yes. skills or Google Earth engine and I, I can still yes. do it. <laughs> so, um, so it, it just takes, you, you just yes, have to take, right. Take a couple of weeks and, and then you'll be able to do it. Tom is ready to show us something. <laughs> so there are four out of the 19 variables that cross between temperature and precipitation. The bio 8, bio 9, bio 18, and 19. Okay. My own recommendation is that you not use those at all. And I'll show you why. Uh, I'm just going to show you the example of bio 19, which is precipitation of the coldest quarter. And there's the, the global view, but let's zoom in on South America. Okay. Now you start seeing these, these kind of weird, fairly hard lines. And this is, going from one of the lowest values to one of the highest values in a region that has no significant topography. Okay, let me, let me fix the, let's see. 
fix the the visualization. Oh, the hell with that. This will probably help. And precipitation is known to be one of the most difficult variables to generate for tropical regions. Uh, the few times they interacted with climatologists, that's their worst nightmare. Um, coming up with good uh, averages, you know, 30 years of precipitation data in, in these tropical regions. So, because we don't have enough uh, meteorological station data points to, to have good interpolations. But notice, but, yeah. notice these hard breaks. A lot of these are in places, and it's not just South America, a lot of these are in places where there really does not exist. What is this? What is this variable? This 19. is 19. And what is this? Is this precipitation? What of the ah, it's, uh, it's precipitation of the coldest quarter, I believe. Okay. Okay. But I never saw this crazy pattern before. <laughs> this, is, this is universal amongst those four variables. Okay. <laughs> Here's my understanding. Well, maybe I'm wrong about this, but imagine that you have for coldest quarter, you have four yeah. or five months that are pretty close as far as cold, right? So your temperature profile in the year might look like this. There are those four or five months and then it comes up again. <laughs> so the coldest quarter in this place might be different from the set of months it, it seems no? that are cold yeah. here versus yeah. here are yeah. different. But then if you have a precipitation trend that is linear, yeah. shifting coldest yeah. quarter from let's say you know January to March yeah. versus February to April, yeah. that changes the precipitation very abruptly. But uh, this, I mean, I just, my feeling is we should not use these four variables at all. Look at those nonlinearities, yeah. those breaks, and they're everywhere. And if and we work with global... things like this where you can't see them. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. Melinda. I was just thinking if we work with uh, um, uh, global species, the four, the four, the coldest four... Um, three months, sorry, calendaristically will be different. <laughs> so if we try to yes, yes. match when data were presence data were collected to, you know, temporally match those, those occurrences to the coldest quarter in this case, uh, we'll have problems because <laughs> different hemispheres will have different months of the year that are coldest. Yeah, this is another reason, like what you were saying, that use just the months and, and, and combine the months and, and done. Yeah. No? No, no. Yeah. I don't know, yes. I think that those are two different things. I mean, one is, imagine, I don't know, a plant or an insect or whatever that's present in a place year-round, and you're just interested in, you know, kind of what's the, the water stress in the, in the moment of its life cycle that is coldest. Maybe that's something that's relevant to your species. So you're not talking about a season specific question. You're just talking about kind of this combination of cold and water stress. Mm -hmm. If I can see that, um, but what I don't see is that those are real features of landscapes. Um, but yeah, you can quite easily instead of grabbing the bioclimatic variables, you can quite easily uh, get the minimum, maximum, and average temperatures and the precipitations, and those come as monthly values. So it's just, I guess we'd get it here probably, but just to click on that, and you get a zip package that has the 12 months of that variable averaged over years. And then you can say, well, I'm only interested in June through August and you know, maybe separately January and February, whatever. You can make yeah. up 
the variables that you want and need for your question. Another thing that I would like to add here with the selection of the variables and uncertainties and these things is like a lot of people want to use these models and calibrate the models in the present to predict the future and climate change and these things. And then precipitation is, is crazy because as, as Mona was saying, like the models are, they, they don't, they disagree in their precipitation uh, predictions for the future and for the past also, for, for the last glacial maximum, they also disagree a lot. Because precipitation is not easy, blah, 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 it's much more complex than temperature that is much more related with where you are in the, in the globe and also the altitude. Uh, so if you include, if you want to work uh, for understanding what is going to happen with your species in the future or in the past, I suggest this, take really few precipitation variables because they are going to increase the uncertainty of your model prediction. And even in the current, even just with these interpolated variables in the present time, the interpolations work way better for temperature because we have the adiabatic lapse rate and, and just known qualities of temperature and how it varies <laughs> across landscapes. With precipitation, you have all sorts of nonlinearities like rain shadow effects and things like that. So the interpolations, even within the present time, don't work very well. Um, there is a question, as you mentioned um, temperature and um, elevation. And uh, huh? there's a question uh, two above the red one, <laughs> twelve sixteen line twelve sixteen, can um, altitude, uh, altitude and temperature layers be used in the same model, or would it be wrong because both are related? And this is, I don't know, I this is one question that stumps me quite often, and I don't use the two together. Uh, but then there are students who tell me, well, elevation is very important for my species. It only occurs between, you know, 1400 meters and, I don't know, 2000 meters. So I, yeah, I don't have a good answer for this, except that I don't include altitude <laughs> because I'm concerned about the um, collinearity. So I don't know what you think now, or Sarah. Well, certainly one guess... thing is the collinearity. And then the other is if you're going to use altitude or elevation for any model transfers in time, you have to be very careful because essentially we're using elevation normally as a proxy for temperature. And yet in different climates, elevation has different meanings. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even in the same climate, elevation at the equator means something very different from the same elevation at 30 degrees or 60 degrees north or south mm -hmm. latitude. You know, I'm, I'm probably my, my own perfect temperature uh, regime is manifested at 2000 meters at about 20 degrees north or south. Mm -hmm. But 2,000 meters at the equator is pretty tropical. Mm -hmm. 2,000 meters at 70 degrees north is ice. <laughs> so you have to be very careful using an indirect variable like elevation, even within the present, because it has such a different meaning as far as environments. Here's one that's a kind of a tough one, and I've I've faced this a number of times, and I've never felt comfortable. Look at this. What if I make a model with raster variables at 30 arc seconds, but I want to project the model? In this case, the question is for last glacial maximum, but what if I want to transfer the model to a different spatial resolution. No, puedes. No, you, you cannot. <laughs> why, why not, Sarah? <laughs> no, you, you cannot. Uh, you, are, you are calibrating 
you are saying that, that your species, uh, the probability of your species at this resolution is this one. You cannot transfer this to a 50 kilometers uh, layer if you calibrate something at one kilometer or something like that. It's not the same. It's not the same. Like my species is very probable to be here when it's 10 degrees in one kilometer, that is 10 degrees in the whole Europe or something like that. So, of course, the more you change the resolution, the more crazy it's going to get. But uh, if you have something, if, if you need to project something and you don't have better resolution than 2.5 arc minutes or whatever, you need to reprocess your first rasters, aggregate the things and make it rougher and make it at a broader resolution. So calibrate again your model for the present at 2.5 uh, arc minutes and then project it like perfectly into the future or into the past. Just as an illustration of that, I'm going to put a paper in the, in the link online uh, by Naraini Barve, uh, where she was working at a resolution, I think of a half degree, and then ask the same questions that I, I'm making this up. Maybe it was a 10th of a degree. And it was really interesting how much the answer changes. In okay. terms of the view changes quite dramatically just mm -hmm. between different resolutions of the same variable. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put it online for everybody to see. Yeah, it's a pity when you have these kind of things, you need to lose resolution. You need to go to the coarsest resolution that you have. Because if not, it's the same like you are creating information where you don't have, which means that you are trusting some algorithm to downscale your 2.5 variables. And then it's, it's, it's not the reality. It's again, you are gaining precision, but you are losing accuracy for sure. So it's, yeah, it can be whatever. And for me, a lot of times is um, like people people feel like super. They want to work with uh, working one kilometer because this is super precise. Like it is not precise. <laughs> it's just an, it's an interpolation. So you don't have a person just going one kilometer and one kilometer and taking the temperature. It's a model. And and I, I think people because when you, they see maps, they trust the maps because you are used to see maps that are I don't know <laughs> the reality. And they don't understand that this is a model. This is not true. And um, yeah, I I think I already mentioned this. Maybe Karen, I don't remember in a previous uh, question and answer session. But I had a very interesting, very uh, educating for me experience um, uh, interaction with a, a climatologist. Um, he was surrounded by biologists at this workshop, and Luis was uh, in this um, Escobar. Luis Escobar was in this workshop. And the climatologist was completely at loss as to why we were all using World Clean. Yes. yes. So when we, talk, <laughs> we have one kilometer resolution data. He said, what? <laughs> and we said, World Clean. No, and then we don't. looked together at this and he, he, was, he was terrified. And then his, reaction, yes. his response was, well, as a climatologist, if I would come to you, the biologist, and tell you, I want maps of one kilometer resolution of this plant give me that. Uh, you would say, well, I'm giving you some models of potential distribution, some, you know, lots of assumptions went into this model and it's a potential distribution. Uh, whereas we download the world thing data, like you said, Sarah, and we assume it's a one kilometer resolution. Every one kilometer, we have the temperature and precipitation data yes. miraculously measured by someone. Um, and yeah, so he was, he, he thought we were reckless actually for using world thing. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we all own Hickman for doing this model because I think he, he's we need to give him a, a, a prize or something because all the biogeography I think it 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 boosted because of this model because he allowed us to to be crazy and be wild and and start <laughs> to think about yeah macroecology in the terms that we are now you know but I think now we need to to step further and now is the time to okay now now we more or less know what we can do now we need to, mm -hmm. to, to build new things more biologically meaningful and, and, and learn about all these things that we were doing all these years what is wrong what is right and 
And this thing about working, I also, in Toledo, I was working in, in a team that they were also climatologists. And for them, they were also the first time like working, like what? The same, like, <laughs> like what the hell is this? And yeah, 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 they, they are not, they don't know because this is more like from the macroecology, biogeography world. I don't think climatologists, they, they, they use this or I don't know, yeah. There's a, there's a special place in one's heart for world clim if one has been active trying to do this sort of analysis long enough to remember back to when we didn't have this sort of data set. So in that sense, yeah, Robert deserves a prize and applause yes. and thanks. And make t-shirts um, with uh, a work <laughs> <him. laughs> But yeah. <laughs> I think we've we the field has has achieved a level of maturity now that you know one we probably shouldn't be depending on global climate surfaces unless we genuinely have global questions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, see some of the work yeah. that Angela Cuervo has done mm -hmm. with creating Mesoamerican and Mexican climate surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, two, we shouldn't just be using the 19 bioclimatic variables. <laughs> make your own. If you know something about your species, yeah. make your own bioclimatic variables that are exactly relevant to your species. Yeah. And then, you know, we should be going beyond climate yeah. as well. I and think in the first years it was more like, uh, my model is better than yours, like a lot of uh, discussion about uh, which model is better, which model is producing the, the boost, and now I think it's more about which environmental layers, what the hell with this, and, and it maybe it's turning to a new uh, Right. Well, you know, new discussion. Sarah, something you said is very important. Um, we really do trust these data sets, these environmental data sets, too much. Um, you know, you, there's all sort of, every method section that says something about quality control and data cleaning and things like that for the occurrence data. Great, that's necessary. But in exactly the same way, we need to do the quality control mm -hmm. and, and, you know, filtering for quality data versus bad quality data um, for the environmental data. You know, again, or, is yeah, that what or, Africa so. looks like? No. Yeah. Yep. There's no line that goes, you know, from from Ethiopia to the DRC in this, you know, and goes from the highest to the lowest values in a few kilometers. It doesn't exist. So I think I think we're at this point where we just need to kind of grow up and take responsibility for really rigorous treatment of environmental data. Yeah, or at least if we don't have any, any like, I don't know which model is better, like put everything then and give an uncertainty. Like this is where all the, yeah, just you do seven models. And, and this was also a question, like uh, if, if I have like three different um, earth system models or like climatic models, should I average the models and then do the, the, the SDM? Or should I do three different models and then average the results? And my suggestion is do the three and then average the results. I don't know what, what, um, what are your thoughts on this? I, I think definitely, definitely do the three separately and average them because you yeah. not only can see the average, but you can also see the departures from the average. Yes. You, know, you might have an average value of five but an average value of five when all three or all 10 or all 30 say five is very different from an average value of five when half of the models say zero and half of the models say 10. Yeah, yeah. I, I would do like 10 models if you have 10 uh, climatic layers and then average results. So this model predicts my species is present here and this is there and this is there. So you put all together and so that the 10 models are saying that the species is here or 50% of the models say that the species is here. Something like that, like the uncertainty of, of your predictions. If you don't have uh, uh, something to say this model is better for this area or something like that, that uh, 
that also people were were uh, asking about this. If we know like this model is better for this area or this other model is better for this other area. I know that uh, there are several teams working with the climatic models and some they are in Canada, others they are in Japan. So I guess the people in Japan are going to have more data from Japan or maybe think of more about monsoons or something like, so maybe it's better because they are there and they, they, they are more sensitive about these kind of things, but I am not sure if we have um, some tool to say, okay, so take Miroc for Southeast Asia and then 60 CSM for North America or for Europe or, or I don't know. I haven't seen that. Uh, Marlon Cole yeah. does have some nice tools for uh, summarizing uncertainty in model outputs now. Cool. Um, so he's got it in kind of the beginnings of an R package. But if you have something that yields many different models, he's got tools for, for just summarizing variances and, and things like that, but also for doing a partition of the variance. So you'll, you might be able to say, well, this part of the variance or this much of the variance is due to GCM selection, and this much right. is due to algorithm cool. parameters, et cetera, et cetera. Ladies, wow, I'm afraid cool. I have to go. I have to teach um, down the hall here. So uh, I think we have, to, we have to stop here. Thanks for a great discussion. I think this is the way we should be doing the question and answer sessions where we take a few meaty topics and go into a fair amount of depth. So thanks a lot. And thank you very much to all the trainees. Well, um, you, a bunch of people have said thank you to Sara and Dirk, and we'll look forward to Mona and Gabriela for, for this coming week. So sure. thanks ladies. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.